First, I want to begin by um, acknowledging the ancestral grounds I stand on, which are that of the Lummi people. And I'm honored to stand on their ancestral grounds. And I honor their ancestors and my ancestors, as we are all intermarried and interrelated as Coast Salish people. And beyond a shadow of a doubt, um, my great grandparents, my grandma, and back since time immemorial, have been here in this area. Sang their songs, danced their dances, shared our dinners and our meals together, and all the things that we as human beings do in life, funerals, births, everything. So I'm honored to be here. And let me start with my traditional name. Squitoch. 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 And that, my grandma taught me, is you need to say it four times so that your ancestors acknowledge you and they know it's you. I carry the ancestral name of my great-great-great-grandmother, Betsy McLean. They gave her as an English name during the uh, census times, but her ancestral name was Squatoch. And Betsy McLean comes from, um, for those of you from Washington State, the Pilchuck River area. And um, <clears throat> my English name is Patty Gobin, and my last name is from my father. And um, my father was um, Snohomish and Upper Skagit. That's what type of um, Indian he is. And um, he's also part French from a French Hudson Bay trader that came through Tulalip area, because that's where my father was ancestrally from, was Tulalip. And um, my mother is Dolores Young, was her maiden, maiden name. And she comes from the Skykomish River up in the Monroe area. And so um, I just need to tell you and acknowledge them, those that created me and came before me. So thank you. And then I'd like to sing a song for you from our people. Um, you'll see today, I'm not sure if I'm going to educate you that much on the treaty rights of us, but I'm going to challenge you to get to know them and challenge you to know that in Washington State or the United States of America, that there's sovereign nations within America. And those sovereign nations are the supreme law of the land, that treaty that binds us all. And so um, this is from um, an auntie of mine I was raised by, and it's called Lakup Sichad O Atida, and in our language, and I don't speak my language except for phrases, our songs, names, but um, you'll see, I'll show you, my grandchildren do. <laughs> and so, Lakup Sichad O Atida means listen to me, listen and understand. Don't listen with this. And don't listen with this, but listen with this right here. And that's how you truly learn, whether it's academics, or whether it's um, the teachings of your families, or your friends. And so we have to listen with our spirit. And o atida means, um, oh my, oh my. And I've told this before, so I don't know, I know um, you've heard me tell about this phrase is so important to me because I heard it all my life by my grandmother who is Selim Young. And um, she spoke broken English and fluent Lachusid and she never taught me how to speak it but when she was mad I knew it meant something <laughs> really important. So I heard, listen to me, oh my. Or she said, this is really important for you, for the future, for now. And so this is Lakup Sachad. And many of these songs have been saved in secret. And these songs have been, have come back to us, the gifts, as they came out of secret when we felt, how would I say it? when we knew that we were a sovereign. 
and we had the right to do this because we are equal to any human being. Um, and so while I sing this, uh, can you turn the camera on because these songs are proprietary? Turn it off. And so um, you have to keep in mind and try to envision how, um, how one might have seen this if you were being told you have to give up the land. And the biggest pressure was a noose, hanging noose that was standing uh, by the stage. That you had to sign this treaty, let's negotiate it, but here's this noose. And if you don't, that's what happens. Um, what I'm proud to say of my relations, the ancestors, is that they had the foresight of me being here today, you being here today, to negotiate that we would, in addition to having reservation and being promised um, health care and housing and education, that we would always have access to our usual and accustomed grounds and unclaimed open and unclaimed lands. And that means when Department of Natural Resources had, has lands in Washington State, which they do, they have to work with us and consult with us when they're going to do something to that land, create trails, parks, blah, 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 or not use it and open up those lands for us to go hunting, gathering for spiritual and cultural purposes. That is the strength of this treaty. And I'm going to promise all of you sitting here today, how many are tribal in here? I love it. <laughs> um, um, I'm going to promise you, and they would tell you the same thing. If we're going to have a future in the Northwest, in Washington State, we have to partner. We have to partner and stand on this treaty. We have to support this treaty. Because as fast as we're growing, with more people coming in that don't understand the Northwest, or even that there are tribes in the Northwest, still in my own city in Marysville, they'll say, are there Indians out here? Are there tribes out here? In Snohomish County, there are really tribes out here? You guys have to push that the real story is being told. In every comp plan for every city, county, that there are tribes in their counties. I'm working on that with my county, Snohomish, to get that simple story told in there. And it's been 10 years I've been working on that. We have to change our mindset and embrace each other because really the founding of America is what we, look at us. We're every color, every, from everywhere, we're everything. This is America at our best. And we need to tell that story. But always remember it came. And I don't know any other way to say it off the backs of the Coast Salish people. And those are my ancestors. And um, in the back of this, it has pictures of my ancestors here. Um, so I challenge you to read that treaty and think of it through different eyes than just English language. And my sister here will tell you, my language, the Lachutzi language, is a verb-based language. It's not a noun-placed language like English is. Person, place, thing, and um, it's verb-placed. Everything in our language plays with another thing. It all works together to make something complete. It's not, it's about, it's very active language. So you can't interpret when it says, oh, there's a river. In my language, river is stolak. That means river. If you go across Sumas, the first band, you, uh, first nation you come to is the Stolo people on the Stolo River. And I said, why, why is it just, I didn't even think about it. Why is it Stolo? Well, that means river. I said, ours is stolak. We speak the same derivative of language. And so I came home to my language department. I was so excited to hear this. And I had been told by past elders, don't ever think that our language is like the English language. It's very active and alive. And it's never a word that stands alone. It always is with something. And um, so I went home to my language department. I said, tell me, um, stolic. I can't believe that. our." That means river to us and to Stolo Nation. Stolo means river. 
I was so excited like a little kid. And this is only 10 years ago, guys, and I'm pretty old. <laughs> and um, they said, um, one of the elders in our language department says, did you know or do you know what stolakwaid means? I said, N no, stolakwaid. And she says, that's the river within right here. That's what it means, literally. The river within, the very blood that runs through your veins is the river within. And it is the same as the river. They are not separate. They are not different. They are exactly the same. And if we could start seeing our environment that way, what a better world we'd live in. I am you and you are me. We're part of each other. And I say this respectfully. I wasn't, I wasn't raised ever to know there was a Santa until I was 13. I wasn't ever raised to know there was an Easter Bunny until I was about 13, or Halloween, or Adam and Eve. I was raised to know that long before I was human, I was King Salmon. That's what I was. And that that's where my bloodline comes from as to hope people. I am King Salmon, specifically King Salmon. And he was at Tulalip Bay looking up at the eagle, or, or in our language, Yakwala, and the Yakwalas had already transformed from being an eagle <coughs> into being a human being walking on the earth at Tulalip. But when the little baby King Salmons were looking up and watching the eagle transform into being human, they were in awe. Don't children always want something? I mean, you guys are all get towards, you're, you are adults. But you remember wanting something that you know you probably shouldn't have had, but you just had to have it and you'd cry about it and throw a fit. My grandkids throw a fit every day. I just, one was throwing a fit on the way here because it went to first day of daycare. She had to go get him. <laughs> and um, so these baby king salmon were at the shore just in wonderment and they said grandfather grandfather because he comes swimming up and he says what are you doing grandchildren and he says we want to become human grandpa please and in our language grandpa it's up it's up we want to become human and grandfather said no no and he says i know how you live here under the salish sea i know how you treat your relations how you show respect and how you do things. And I'm not here to teach you if you become human. And they said, please, please. And when my grandkids say to me and they cry, please, please, I go, OK, let's see how we can make it happen. <laughs> and so Grandfather King Salmon <coughs> said to his grandchildren, he said, at Tulalip Bay, this is what my granny told me. She said, um, Grandfather King Salmon said, all right, I'll let you become human, but only on these conditions. That every year, once a year, you come back here at springtime when the monarch butterfly appears. That's your, that's your symbol to come to me at the edge of the waters at Tulalip Bay. Just like you're sitting here, it's what Tulalip Bay looks at, like when, they, when we, we sing and drum these songs. He says, and I want you to come here and I want you to sing our songs and when I hear you drumming and singing, I'll come to Tulalip Bay. And what I want to know when I come to Tulalip Bay, and the reason you drum and sing and don't call me with your human voice, grandfather, is because I will know you by this language, our songs and our dances, but I won't know you by your human voice. And so, and when you're there, I'm gonna, I want to report on how you're do that you haven't forgotten who you are and where you come from, and that you, um, how you're treating your human relations as a human being, that you're being respectful and good, and I want to know how you're treating the earth outside of the Salish Sea, because I know how you respect the Salish Sea, but I need to know you're treating this earth good. And he says, if you cease to do this, then you will cease to exist as a people. And you know, that story was hidden for a long time. And in the 70s, some of our elders, after we won the Bolt decision, it was a rebirth for so many things within ourselves, um, said, we need to do this this year. And we had elders from Lummi and Swinomish, Tulalip, because I was a little tiny girl. They came to Gert together and taught these songs and dances to me as a little girl, now my grandchildren. And now guess what I do? 
I teach these songs and dances. And every year when the monarch butterfly appears, we go to Tulalip Bay and we drum and sing and call Grandfather King Salmon. And we host him as our great host, the great Siab chief at our, at our dinners, and then bring him back and return him to the Salish Sea so that we can have um, a blessing for another good year because he would give up his life for us as human beings for sustenance and give us strength. And um, we never forget that we come from King Salmon. Um, so much of this was lost right after the treaty. I think it was about 19, 1901 or early 1900s. This was signed in 1855 before um, the reservations, um, our people came to the reservations and they were allotted land. So that everybody, just like a Western civilization, had their own little track of land. And you had to stay there. There was no concept of that in our culture. You had to stay there. And so um, that, it took them that long to provide homes because it was illegal to have our longhouses. And <clears throat> First thing the United States government did at Tulalip was build these Victorian houses. And my grandma told me as soon as they built them, many of them burnt down because our people built fires in the middle of the floor of the longhouse and it's dirt and we still do today. And that's where we cooked and did everything. And many of the people didn't know that you put it in the cook stove, the wood burning stove, and they built, the old people built it right in the floor of the house and burnt the house down. It was a real learning experience for our ancestors and a very sorrowful one, pitiful, my grandma would say, to um, have to change a way of life. And along with that, um, there had to be a government office for all these Indians. And so the government office was at Tulalip. There was a government office there and a boarding school. And it was called an industrial school. And this school was to teach literally our kids. My grandma was one of the first to go into the boarding school. She was five years old from my family and um, <clears throat> was to teach them how to be agriculturalists, to grow crops and to eat the food you grow and to stop wandering around. And that's what the document stopped, wandering around and looking for resources and to civilize them, teach them about Christianity and to teach them that their ways were savage and wrong and that it didn't matter if my grandma was full blood native and looked native, because if you look at me, I, I have non-native blood in me, and it's very strong in me, but if you see my brothers, some of them look full blood native, and that's just, we're kind of like puppies. <laughs> and I'm not ashamed of that. I know who I am, I'm Coast Salish. And um, <clears throat> so um, this boarding school also came to Tulalip, and um, we've had, just recently redid the we don't have any buildings left from it except for a dining hall. And it was called the Girls' Dining Hall. And that dining hall we just recently refurbished for conferences and meetings. And the first time we opened it, we invited every tribe for a meeting with all uh, the state, the feds. Um, I don't remember if you were there for, to discuss how do we save the Salish Sea and protect it. That was pre-killer whales. That was only, what, a year and a half ago, two years ago? We were worried about them, but not like we are today. And so um, that building um, was the, is the last one. But um, one, a Lummi elder came up to me and said to me, my dad, my grandpa, my dad, was beat here. And he cried. Because that was a day of reckoning for him. That here he stands with the freedom to fight for our treaty rights, to fight for our way of life and to raise it up. And that's a real healing thing for us. And being young like you are, maybe some of you have suffered atrocities in your life. By the time I was your age, I did. And it wasn't just about being native, but when I was in my teens, early 20s, I really didn't like me. And a lot of it was because of this, because my teachings were far and few between and they were broken because of this boarding school. And so, um, but I learned to love myself and to accept who I am. And, um, and Stephanie's heard me, uh, so many people have heard me talk about this, 
that a defining day for me was I've always hated the Catholic Church because of what it did to my grandmother. And I've always, she always wanted me to go there because the only thing for her was to be a good Catholic. And if she couldn't be a good Catholic, then she would die and go to hell. That's literally her belief all her life because of the teachings at the boarding school. She wanted to attain that. So I hated the Catholic Church because I couldn't understand how they could hurt her the way she did. She suffered horrific atrocities from day one, um, every kind of abuse you could think of. And so um, it wasn't until about four years ago, maybe, and I was leaving for work, and I worked directly for my um, board of directors. I work in the treaty rights office. And they had this big meeting with me, and, and I was running late, and I'm running down, put my shoes on, looking at the TV, and my husband's Hispanic, very Catholic. And, he, and he's watching the new pope talk to the House and the Senate side in Washington, D.C. And the Speaker of the House is sitting right behind the pope, our new pope. And, he, and the Speaker of the House, I had dealt with many times, and he, I have to honestly say he was at times very disrespectful to me and my tribe because he didn't see us equal to any other American. And so I saw him crying, the Speaker of the House, and I thought, why is he crying? I've only known him to just be staunch and tough. And so I go, and I'm putting on my shoes, and I sit down in a chair, and my husband says, you're going to be late for work. I, said, I didn't say anything to him, and I, and I began to hear the Pope. And he says, you know, we all came to America and I'm paraphrasing, we all came to America. All of us love America. I come here to America understanding you all came here for freedom, freedom of religion, freedom to self-determine the way of life you want to live because you were um, tired of some of the things that were happening in your own homeland. And he came to America and established America. He said, what a beautiful thing, and you're living that freedom today. And he says, um, but the atrocities that were committed on the indigenous people of this land, we can never undo. By then I'm crying. I think, I know why he's crying. He's listening to, to the Pope. And my husband's saying, get to work. And I said, no, I'll be late for this. And he says, but what we can do is ensure that those atrocities are never committed again. And that's what I'm asking you. As you grow up, never allow those atrocities to be committed again. See me as human, equal to you. And as a little girl, I can honestly tell you I wasn't human. And sometimes in my meetings with politicians or different people, I am not seen as human still today. I'm, saw, I'm, I'm seen as less than, but not to this crowd. <laughs> This is this. You are the people I want to reach and beg you in your education, no matter what field you go into, to do the right thing. If you end up in Washington State or California, wherever you're at, always acknowledge those indigenous people in the treaties of the land, the supreme law of the land. Only two in the United States of America. That's the United States of America and treaty tribes. Those are the only two supreme laws of the land in the United States of America. And, and especially you environmentalists, do we have many here? <laughs> Please learn our stories. Learn about us. Because what we have to do is partner to be strong in a world that's ruled by industry. The Trans Mountain Pipeline is ruled, is ruling everything. Keystone Pipeline, the fracking. Can we take much more? Uh, I'm not sure when I have to stop. <laughs> the clock is wrong. So the, it's 5.15 right now. The class ends at, officially at 5.20, and it would be good to. Oh my god. So, but we can, go, we can go a little bit over that, because I know students will want to ask. I just want to tell you that um, Lummi, Swinomish, Suquamish, and Tulalip joined forces with the First Nation bands in um, the Salish Sea to fight Trans Mountain Pipeline. And it was about three years ago, we testified in Canada to the Energy Board protesting the Trans Mountain Pipeline because they had done no study. It was just going to be carte blanche stomp, stamped. 
done no study on vessel traffic impacts to the Salish Sea. What if there was a spill? What happens to all of our lifeways, not just native, but it's the end of a lifeway that we know today. And we're still the Great Northwest. And so um, what impact do they have on treaty tribes? Because when you're in the way of fishing and these big carriers are in the way of our fishing or if there's a spill, um, it destroys our treaty rights and that's the supreme law of the land. They told us no, we couldn't. And we happened to find a document from 1970s and Dale Johnson from Macaw Nation on behalf of the Northwest Indian Fish Commission. When they were first testify, opening testimonies, when it was the first inception, he went and testified. We found a literally one page article in my dad's stuff and I said to Earth Justice is our attorney for all of the First Nation and the tribes. Um, look what I found, we did it before. They sent it in and they allowed us to testify. We did and um, they denied the permit based solely, and it took a couple years, um, there was no meaningful consultation to the First Nation people of Canada. There was um, no vessel traffic study done on impacts to the Salish Sea. And um, the other one was, there was no study done to the impacts of the resident killer whale. And so where we're at today, we just got done testifying the same tribes um, three months ago up in um, Van Victoria, BC. They held the hearings and there were many First Nations in the city waiting to do their testimony, which is far longer than ours because they will go into their traditional ways and how it impacts. We pretty much stuck to the resident killer whale and the impacts to our lifeways in general, our fishing, our crabbing, and everything that we rely on, our resources for our lifeways. And, um, and the clincher was when Canada bought Trans Mountain Pipeline. Now it's a different deal. Where we're at today is um, it's been approved, but on hold until they do that meaningful consultation. And they're only announcing First Nations. And um, they do a vessel traffic study and if you go online and read the document on the Trans Mountain Pipeline and the decision by um, Canada, you'll see in there, everything says, after almost every paragraph, that we know there will be impacts and loss to killer whales. We know this will impact the First Nation indigenous people, and every once in a while say, and tribes. <laughs> and we know these things, that if there's a spill, it's gonna be devastation, we know that but the good outweighs the bad. And in the betterment of all of Canada, it's in our best interest to go forward with the Trans Mountain Pipeline. So where we're at today with um, Earth Justice is we will be meeting, I just spoke to them today, we're going to be meeting with them in a couple weeks with our attorneys, Earth Justice attorneys, First Nations and tribes to talk about where do we go from here? Because my chairwoman went there and testified so eloquently. And she ended her, her testimony with, she said, this is so important to my grandchildren, my unborn grand, great grandchildren. I will die on this. I will die for it. That's how I feel. And so um, stay tuned and you can follow it. They put it right out as soon as the whole document, as soon as it happens on the Trans Mountain Pipeline and um, and certainly call me and we can keep you in tune with that. Because we all need to stand together. It's not that I don't want vessel traffic, but let's be reasonable about it. And then also, um, you can make better tankers that if you do have a spill, it's gonna be contained. There's many things they can do. And to be honest with you, we've met with some industry and they want to do the right thing. But the push for money. Money, money, money outweighs everything. And so let's get it going, let's get it out there. And it will drastically impact the lifeways of Washingtonians, we the Coast Salish people, the First Nations, and can Canadian citizens that love the Salish Sea. So um, I don't have any time, I can flip through these really fast. My grandma, this is my grandma. <laughs> um, this is Tulalip and um, all the canoes that are there. 
and our longhouses, and um, this is early 1900s before they made us burn everything down, throw, change all our life ways so that we become civilized. <laughs> These are three grandmas from when all, um, when we started our first roles at Tulalip Tribes. They are the three ma matriarchs that their bloodline flows through most of the people that are at Tulalip, whether you be Lummi, Swinomish, or Snohomish. And um, do they look happy? That's what I'm asking you. My granny made me look at these pictures for hours as she would teach me about what was going on and ask me, what do you think they felt? She said they were pitiful. Um, later, um, early 1900s and um, after um, the non-Indian came, hop picking. We went to, um, people would say we were immigrants. <laughs> And we went hop picking strawberries, followed the resources in a different way, and that's how we provided a little bit of change and food for our people. And these um, um, ladies here are elders from our tribe. Um, this is um, Snoqualmie, Snoqualmie family. And um, this is, I just show this because they have Western clothing on, and they also have their regalia on and their um, spiritual dancing attire that trying to retain some of it. And then um, this is a grandfather from our reservation drying salmon the way our people used to dry salmon, that we still dry salmon this way. We still do it. And it is better than anything you buy in the store. <laughs> and here's grandma and grandpa here. And this is a temporary house that our people lived in with cattail mats. Um, we lived in longhouses during the winter and got in our canoes, put everything on there, and traveled to um, our various summer sites following the resources all the way up into the San Juan Islands, all the way up into the Fraser. Uh, this is my grandma's saying. Um, oh, no, this is um, a nun from the boarding school, um, early 1900s. She had to give a report to the President of the United States at that time and say, how are these Indians? Are they becoming civilized? And um, she said, if civilization meant speaking English, worshiping God the white man's way, using knives and forks, keeping spotlessly clean and sewing and dressing the white man's way, then yes, they lack civilization. But if civilization meant a great culture, that, that they did have. And she spoke had the audacity to speak up and in her own way question, so what is civilization? And this is my grandma at the boarding school. She lived there from the age of five until 19, and she became the head seamstress for the boarding school, and every child had the same dress, same <coughs> hairdo, everything. When she went to the boarding school, um, she had to have all her hair cut off, bathed in lye, and was told to never speak her language. And being a little five-year-old with her friends, when no one was around, she says, how do you say cat in your language? When she learned to speak English more fluently. And, and she says, peesh, I say it, peesh, peesh. And someone from Lummi would say it a little different. Different, totally different. Uh, you know, the, the languages, could, you could go three miles and it was different. They were playing games, and the matron, she said, came in and said, who is speaking their language? And my grandma, being a little five girls, I am. And when she said that, she was stripped naked and whipped from head to toe and put in a cement jail on the shores of the beach, and those cement building, uh, that platform, all the cement walls have fallen into Tulalip Bay right now, but they're still there right below the boarding <laughs> school dining hall. And it was all cement with a cement top. You couldn't see in, out. There was no windows. And it locked from the outside. But it did have rebar at the bottom, so there's open this much on the bottom. And so at five years old, the tide came in, and the tide went out. For two days, she was in there. She thought she was going to die. And she said, from that day forward, I never spoke my language. I learned then that it wasn't a good thing. How wrong. <laughs> wrong. <laughs> and so um, this is uh, my grandma here and her sister at the boarding school. My grandma is the young lady there and her young baby sister is there. Her name is Eleanor. When my grandma went in, her name was Selim. Selim Young. 
And when she came out, she could no longer use the word Silam because that was a Kosilish Lashutsi baby name she received at birth, Silam. And so they renamed her Cecilia Hannah so that she was more civilized. So when we went to town, as a little girl, she would say, don't call me Grandma Selim here at Safeway in Marysville, call me Cecilia. I wouldn't even say her name, Cecilia, I was rebellious. I only called her Grandma Selim. My firstborn grandbaby, who's 25, when she came out, I named her Selim. That's her name. Um, these are some of the, you see everybody's dressed the same. The education was Montessori. Um, Living here for nine months to 10 months out of the year, who's teaching you how to love? Who's teaching you how to be nurtured as a grandma and grandpa do? Teaching you how to cook and teaching you how to do the ways of your, whatever's under anyone's house. Um, they learned to, my grandma said, we learned to be good military students. So as a grandma, she was a good military grandma. Loving, I knew she loved me more than life, but didn't know how to hold me or kiss me and say I love you. Um, my grandma is in this picture. She's the one in the middle at the sewing machine right there, Tulalip boarding school. And most of these are probably, they're Lummi and Swinomish and Suquamish people, actually from all over. This is uh, the boys doing agriculture work. Um, my grandma is um, in this picture. She's down above the T for Tulalip. She also worked in the hospital as a nurse's aide to Charles Buchanan. He's the man right there. He was the doctor and she suffered many atrocities from him. Uh, this is my grandma here at the boarding school and to show the outside world that their tax money was being used in the right way, they performed. Every single tribe, tribal ch child there um, performed for the outside world because so, they wanted to know if their taxes were civilizing these Indians. And so they had these classical orchestras, my grandma would tell me, and she's the one with the cello. And she said this band teacher was very cruel and um, she played the wrong note this day while she was playing the cello and he slapped the back of her head and the, it um, poked her in the eye and she lost one eye. Um, this is the signing of, uh, at, we celebrated the Point Elliott Treaty, we still do here today, but it, do you honestly think we'd be celebrating the treaty? Some brilliant elder had the foresight to write to the United States government and say, do you mind if we celebrate the signing of the treaty? Because all the elders on every reservation got together and said, we're so scared and concerned that our kids will never know who they are as Coast Salish people. Let's see if we can trick the United States government into allowing us to drum and sing, have canoe races for three days and celebrate. And that's what they did. And so still today we do that in January but um, we just call it Treaty Days, but it's in celebration of each other and each other's family there now in freedom. Um, here's the canoe races. Here's the dinner they had inside the longhouse um, at Tulalip, and many of these old elders are um, my relations and blood relatives. And um, um, for everything they did to my grandma, Here's a picture of um, an older one. Now I have many more grandchildren of uh, myself, my oldest daughter, my granddaughter Shelby. Her name is Quitholitsa. And my daughter carries my Indian name, Squatoh, with me because it hadn't been spoken for almost 150 years. And so an elder from Swinomish said, you both need to carry it so we know what goes on. <laughs> and uh, my son-in-law, you see um, with the cedar hat, he's a Yakima. Uh, tribal member, and he is also part Suquamish and Irish. And he is now, has his doctorate, and he's the, um, I don't know what the title is, at the University of Washington. He's the head professor over all of um, the doctorate program for teachers in, at the University of Washington. My brother Glenn, who used to be a tribal leader and is running for the board again, <laughs> and my nephew Andrew. But this shows you the res and baby Kamea there in front of her dad. My grandma, I, only time she wouldn't talk about the boarding school or she was never one to be negative or talk about bad things. Um, she was always very respectful. And I, I'd always say, what was the boarding school like? And she'd say, oh, I can't talk about that. Every once in a while she would tell me. And one time I said, grandma, please tell me, about, when I was older, tell me about the boarding school. She says, oh, 
They wanted me to forget my way of life and learn to be civilized and learn to be a good white person. And she never said white in a bad way, you know, in any negative sense. To her, that was a good benchmark to learn to be a good white person. I still don't know what a good white person is. And again, she didn't mean that in a negative way. She meant, I still haven't become that. And I'm so, and she was 92 when she said this, so disappointed in myself. Um, she said, all I know is that I learned to march, 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 and not speak my language. You got in big trouble for that. I got many whippings and confinement. And uh, when my grandma died, she was um, in the hospital, and we were with her, and she died speaking our language. So it's a great time to be Coast Salish. I'm proud of who I am and where I come from. And when she died, I whispered in my grandma's ear and said, I will do all the things you could never do. Because she was so broken, she didn't know how to get that healed. And um, I think all of us feel the same as Native people, that we will continue to improve our lives, our souls, our spirits, and heal, and liberate our ancestors, because that's what they intended for us to be strong. Part of it is you learning this treaty and know that it's yours as much as it, 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 it is mine. And so um, that's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you.